Muslim atheist tussle. Is Quran scientific? Assalamu alaikum. This video will discuss First, why Muslims like to boast about the Quran being scientific. Second, Different branches of science in which Quranic statements were considered scientific. 3. Embryology in the Quran and its comparison to Aristotle and Galen. 4. Can there be scientific statements in scriptures earlier than the Quran? 5. Why it bothers atheists when Muslims boast that the Quran contains scientifically correct statements. 6. Atheist efforts to disprove scientific statements in the Quran. 7. An analysis of atheist efforts to disprove scientific correctness of the Quran. Allah sent the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah bless him and grant him peace as a messenger to the whole universe. Allah says in the Quran, we send thee not, but as a mercy for all creatures. And so Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah to the Bedouins in the desert, just as he is the messenger of Allah to the present day scientist in his modern laboratory. He is the messenger of Allah to all peoples of all times. Before Prophet Muhammad, each messenger was sent exclusively to his own people. Allah said, to every people, a guide has been sent. But Prophet Muhammad's message is to all of mankind. And it is for this reason that Allah has given a supporting proof to the message of Prophet Muhammad, a proof which is different from the proofs given to the messengers before him. The proofs of the preceding messengers were only seen by their contemporaries and possibly by some generations immediately following them. Then Allah would send a new messenger supported with a new miracle in order to revive the faith of his people. Because Prophet Muhammad was destined to be the last of the prophets until the day of resurrection, Allah has given him an everlasting miracle as a supporting proof. If we ask a Jew or a Christian to show us the miracles of the Prophet Moses or Jesus, they both would submit that it is not within human power to redemonstrate any of those miracles now. Moses came cannot be recreated and the Prophet Jesus cannot be invoked to raise people from the dead. For us today these miracles are nothing more than historical reports. But if a Muslim is asked about the greatest miracle of the Prophet Muhammad, he can readily show his book the Quran, which is a miracle in our hands. It is an open book for all mankind to examine its contents. First, let us now explore why Muslims like to boast about the Qur'an being scientific. Islam advises Muslims to remain humble, and history shows that Muslims who led the world on Islamic principles were always humble. Those who strove for victory just to gain power were an exception. The reason why a Muslim appears to boast about the Qur'an is because he or she sees the Qur'an to be scientifically correct. In an age where everything is evaluated on the criteria of whether it's scientific or not. So he thanks Allah for showing this sign to him. And also likes to show this scientific correctness of the Qur'an to the world. And invite others to enter this faith. Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. There is no human work prior to modern times that contains statements which were equally in advance of the state of knowledge at the time they appeared and which might be compared to the Quran. The Quran is considered by Muslims to be the last revelation of God and the most well preserved. If scientific ideas are to be in any scripture, this should be the one. It is special in its position among all previous revelations in that it was memorized and preserved since the time of its revelation. At the time it was called a miracle given to the last prophet, peace be upon him, and it's believed that it will continue to expound its miraculous nature for people who have certitude. 
Thus, in every age, Muslims have tried to uncover miracles of the Qur'an, whether linguistic, or scientific, or historical, etc. The verses of the Qur'an were analyzed by followers of Islam in every century in this endeavor. But as far as scientific miracles were concerned, Muslims were not the ones who proposed this notion noticeably to the West. It was Dr. Maurice Bukai who happened to come across the Qur'an during his studies on Egyptian mummies. He was the first to lecture about its scientific correctness in the French Academy of Medicine. This paved the way to many Muslim conferences, inviting scientists worldwide to ponder upon Qur'anic verses and try to discover their scientific implications. Qur'an chapter 3 verse 7 states that it contains two types of verses. One, the ones that are clear to understand, describing laws for society, while there are two, mutashabihat, or allegorical verses, which pertain to the knowledge of creation, which can be reinterpreted if we get further knowledge. So the reinterpretation attempt of verses relating to different fields of science wasn't against Islamic law. But the recommended attitude of Muslims after these attempts of reinterpretation should be to keep themselves satisfied with what the clearly stated verses reveal. Type 1 To elaborate it more explicitly, I would like to discuss my own initial experience with the science in the Quran, especially embryology described in the Quran 86 verse 7. When I started to read the detailed explanation of the Quran for the first time, I didn't make existence of scientific statements in the Quran as a criterion to judge its truth. Because as a clinician in obstetrics, I knew that parameters in science keep changing. So for me, a scripture of God was not supposed to give any scientific statement. I was reading a detailed explanation of the Quran by Sayyid Abul Ala Maududi and this verse was explained by him in a very different way. Nothing of his explanation was understandable to me, except that I had to apply my own knowledge of embryology to understand it. Then I noted an asterisk there, which directed me to an appendix for explanation of that verse. It was a letter from a clinician who was also explaining the verse as I had thought. In my opinion, the verse was describing that Allah created us from a ma'in dafiq that comes out from between ribs and spines and our knowledge of embryology tells us that ovaries and testes descend from that place during embryonic period and retain their blood supply from that very place, even in adulthood. So testes and ovaries can be said to belong to that part of our body. The clinician who wrote the letter was also having the same opinion. The verse was explained differently by other scholars too. Many of them have explained it spiritually. Not everyone needs to know the original embryonic location of testes and ovaries and their descent to understand this verse. What he needs to do is to have faith that this verse is a revelation and read the next verse onwards to implement what is being asked. But for the one who has knowledge of embryology and has faith, this verse will click and will thrill him. An experience that I had after pondering on the above verse. To such a Muslim, it is a scientific miracle of the Quran. And that's what Muslims wanted atheists to accept, or at least to give a thought. This the details is not, not stuff there. that requires a huge library to figure out. This requires a passing acquaintance with general knowledge about the primitive state of biology at the time. So let man see from what he has created. He has created from a water gushing forth, proceeding from between the backbone and the ribs. Verily, Allah is able to bring him back to life. The Quran is a religious book which has no scientific purpose. Whenever man is invited to reflect upon the works of creation and numerous natural phenomena, the obvious intention is to stress divine omnipotence. Second, different branches of science in which Quran statements were considered as scientific. Dr. Maurice Bukai categorized the verses from the Quran and ascribed them to different branches of science. But in later conferences, verses related to embryology gained maximum attention. I was asked about some of the, the meaning of some of the verses in the Quran and uh, I tried 
to uh, interpret them as best I could, and that really started a, a study which has lasted for about 10 years in a part-time way. Some scientists attach themselves as part-time engagement in researching the Quranic phrases and their scientific significance. One of them was Professor Keith Moore, who was most impressed with the stage of fetal development described in the Quran. Professor E. Marshall Johnson, Tevin Persaud, and Professor Gerald G. Goringer were other embryologists who gave statements in favor of different verses of the Quran. The concept of change in the geographic dimensions of the continents is a very modern concept. Perhaps the most intriguing thoughts are from a hadith in Sahih Muslim, where Muhammad states as one of the signs of the coming of the Day of Judgment, next slide, that Arab areas will return to being return to being fertile and green and with rivers. The archaeological and geological evidence that they once were green and will become green again is less than a century old. I have been asked, could Muhammad personally have known these things? The answer of a cautious scientist is, it is not impossible, but it would require a very sophisticated awareness of natural history. The Middle East has been and still is one of the more earthquake-prone parts of the world. Oral tradition may have mentioned fractures opening during earthquakes, and certainly the earth trembles as if its interior were turbulent on such occasions. In summary, the Islamic texts can be divided into three categories related to the past, the present, and the future. We need research into the history of early Middle Eastern oral traditions to know whether, in fact, such historical events have been reported. If there is no such record, it strengthens the belief that God transmitted through Muhammad bits of his knowledge that we have only discovered for ourselves in recent times. We look forward to a continuing dialogue on the topic of science and the Quran uh, in the context of geology. Thank you very much. That's a difficult question which I uh, uh, have been uh, thinking about since our uh, uh, discussions here. I'm uh, I'm impressed at, at uh, how remarkably some of the uh, ancient writings uh, seem to correspond to uh, modern and, and recent astronomy. Uh, I'm not uh, a sufficient scholar of, uh, of human events and of, of human history uh, to uh, project myself completely and reliably in, into the, uh, the circumstances that an ancient uh, or the, that 1400 years ago uh, would have prevailed. But uh, certainly, uh, I'd like to leave it that, that uh, what we have seen is. Uh, is remarkable. Uh, it may or may not admit of, of uh, scientific explanation. There, there may uh, well be, have, well, have to be uh, uh, something beyond uh, what we understand as ordinary human experience uh, to account for the writings that we've seen. But uh, it's not uh, my intention or my my position at this point to provide uh, a uh, an answer to that I I've said a lot of words without uh, I think expressing exactly what you want me to express but uh, as it's my job as a scientist to remain uh, independent of, of certain questions and I think that's one that I best stop just a little bit short of, of giving you the complete answer that that you might desire. Jolie Simpson, Professor Alfred Croner, Yushidi Kazan, Professor Armstrong, William Hay, Durya Rao, Professor Saveda and Professor Tejata Tayasan. One may refer to following website to read about the statements they made. Embryology in the Quran and its comparison to Aristotle, Galen, 
and modern science. Now, in the following passages from the Quran, we introduce the concept of stages in human development. Uh, God created man from a quintessence of uh, clay. Uh, he then uh, placed him in as a nutfa, a droplet, in a place of uh, settlement, firmly fixed. Then we make the nutfa into a nalika, a leech-like structure, and then uh, he changed the nalika into a mudga, a chewed-like uh, substance. Uh, then we made out of that mudga uh, isam, I can't read too well here, skeleton, and then we clothed the bones with muscles. Uh, then we caused him to grow, and then we came into, into being and attained the definitive the human form, uh, so blessed be God, uh, the best to create. This Fetal development can be staged in different ways, based upon time or based upon different organs and different systems. The Quran describes it based upon microscopic appearance and that description was well advanced in terms of the knowledge of the Prophet peace be upon him and in terms of lack of instruments to enlarge their specimens. That's why Professor Keith Moore had no objection in accepting that the description was miraculous according to the scientific development of the time the Quran was revealed. Now let's examine the claim that this miraculous description of embryology might have been plagiarized from Aristotle or Galen. The ancient scientists who covered a wide range of science in their work, including the development of the fetus. And how the Quran used the right wordings to escape becoming unscientific for all future generations. Let us refer to some passages from Aristotle, which show his concept on reproductive biology and their comparison with the Quran and modern embryology. To suppose, then, either that heat and cold are the causes of male and female, or that the different sexes come from the right and left, is not altogether unreasonable in itself. For the right of the body is hotter than the left, and the concocted semen is hotter than the unconcocted. All concoction works by means of heat. Therefore the males of animals must needs be hotter than the females. For it is by reason of cold and incapacity that the female is more abundant in blood in certain parts of her anatomy. Aristotle on the Generation of Animals, page 66 and 67. When the material secreted by the female in the uterus has been fixed by the semen of the male, this acts in the same way as rennet. Acts upon milk. Aristotle, on the Generation of Animals, page 34. Since what the male contributes to generation is the form and the efficient cause, while the female contributes the material. In fact, as in the coagulation of milk, the milk being the material, the fig juice or rennet is that which contains the curdling principle, so acts the secretion of the male. Aristotle, on the generation of animals, page 19, it is plain that the female does not contribute semen to the generation of the offspring. Aristotle, on the Generation of Animals, page 17. Aristotle was a very great scientist and he was very efficient observer of nature. He compared anatomy of many animals, but he didn't have all the advanced technology of current times, so he did commit mistakes. He thought that semen was formed in men after a workup or concoction of blood. The blood was ought to be deficient in women due to its regular flow out of their body. So female cannot have any contribution in offspring formation. The menstrual flow was the material which was acted upon by semen to form the child and the quantity of blood mattered and was supposed to be in right proportion. He also thought that women need to have uterus to store the blood and the organ which stores blood need to be larger than the male passages which transmit semen. So uterus is a big organ in the females. We know that uterus doesn't store blood. He thought males and females are formed on different sides of uterus, although he wasn't very sure. He also thought that men should be hotter as they need to do concoction of blood to create semen, while women don't need to do that. Any of such concepts are not taken in the Quran. Aristotle had the concept that females have lesser teeth than males. Quran escapes such errors. 
This much is for the difference. Coming to similarities between the Quran and the Stotel, we should note the Stotel described the formation of fetus from menstrual blood and the Quran used the word alqa which was translated as blood for a long time. Quran is a moral guidance for humanity. If it had directly said that the earth rotates around the sun 1400 years back, how many people would have stayed confused for more than 1000 years about its reliability? The same is true of the word alqa. Aristotle said blood is the material on which semen acts to create a child. Quran used the word alqa, one of its translation being blood clot, saving Quran from becoming unscientific for more than a thousand years. When modern science will discover the development of fetus befitting the other meaning of the word alqa. This is Hirudo medicinalis, better known to you and me as a leech. It's a parasite. It takes whatever it needs to live by sucking the blood of whatever it can latch onto. In this case, that's me. As it sucks my blood, it takes from it all that it needs to live. It literally lives off me. And the whole of pregnancy is shaped by a similar kind of parasitic relationship. Unlike the leech, the developing embryo doesn't suck the mother's blood, but it does raid her blood for the raw materials it needs to grow. From the word go, both leech and embryo are out for themselves. The cells of the embryo spread out as they divide and invade the mother's uterus. It's almost an aggressive attack. But surprisingly, the army of foreign cells does not meet any resistance from the mother's own defense systems. Alaka. Alaka refers to a leech-like appearance, especially at about 22 days, as shown in this slide. This is a leech, and this is the human embryo, about 23 days. I think you have to agree that the similarity between these uh, structures is amazing. Junta de Mawiya. Dama. In my opinion, many a scholars might have chosen a clot of blood to translate alaka was because they might have some knowledge of Aristotelian description of embryology, which described fetus to develop from menstrual blood. The common word for blood clot is dam. And if the Prophet had read the Aristotle, and if he was the author of the Quran, he would have surely used this word to comply with Aristotle. But nowhere in the Quran any other word was used in the Quranic staging except Alqa. And it was used in the Quran as Alqa is the word that was most proper for all generations of people to understand that we humans have developed through various stages by the power of God, which is what God wants to convey to us. For ancients, translation of Alqa was a clot of blood, complying with Aristotle, and for us, it is something that clings. Thus, Allah has taken care of a believer's faith in every generation, and Quran can never be called unscientific for any new development in science. That's why every statement in the Quran that relates to science is such that you cannot falsify it. But the one searching for a scientific statement that will explain the conditions to properly describe ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection or to get criteria of selecting a proper embryo to transfer for best outcome of IVF, then he is mistaken. That's not what Quran was revealed for. Coming to Galen, who was a very great scientist, analyzing different works of his time and of previous scientists and drawing his own conclusions. He agreed with Aristotle about the role of semen being an active principle working on blood to create progeny as can be seen from his writings. But nature doesn't preserve the original character of any kind of matter. If she did so, then all parts of the animal would be blood, that blood, namely, which flows to the semen from the impregnated female and which is, so to speak, like the statuary's wax, a single uniform matter, subjected to the artificer. Galen, on the Natural Faculties, page 14. He believed semen as seed and uterus as earth.
the seed having been cast into the womb or into the earth, for there is no difference, then, after a certain definite period, a great number of parts become constituted in the substance which is being generated, these differ as regards moisture, dryness, coldness and warmth, and in all the other qualities which naturally derive therefrom. Galen. On the Natural Faculties. Page 3. This is what he says. This can be compared to Quranic verse where the word al harth has been used. But Galen describes the growth further, saying that in its substance generate different parts which differ in heat, coldness, moisture and dryness. Something modern science will not give any relevance, nor did Quran give any such statement. That, which was previously semen, when it begins to procreate and to shape the animal, becomes, so to say, a special nature. For in the same way that Phidias possessed the faculties of his art even before touching his material, and then activated these in connection with this material. For every faculty remains inoperative in the absence of its proper material, so it is with the semen, its faculties it possessed from the beginning, while its activities it does not receive from its material, but it manifests them in connection therewith. Now, it is not for the wax to discover for itself how much of it is required. That is the business of Phidias. Accordingly the artificer will draw to itself as much blood as it needs. Here, however, we must pay attention and take care not unwittingly to credit the semen with reason and intelligence. Galen, on the Natural Faculties, page 15. His concept of semen and menstrual blood was also not in accordance with modern science. He believed semen as active principle acting upon menstrual blood, from which fetus arises. This is wrong as per modern knowledge. Quran also does not describe any such concept. Galen thought that semen has a creative power and it attracts to itself what is useful for it, the amount of blood, to create the fetus. And he also thought that semen feeds itself of blood and grows. He described three stages of every organogenesis, genesis, growth and nutrition. He defined genesis as due to generative and alterative faculty. His further details make his description unscientific. These alterative and shaping faculties are only grossly comparable to Quranic staging. First one is the nutfa or the drop stage. And then the, the second is the clack, or shaping stage, and then the nasha, or the growth stage. Now the proposed system is clear, it's comprehensive, and conforms with uh, uh, present embryological uh, knowledge. The Quran says nutfa, halqa, and nasha. The, this uh, second or shaping stage begins as the alaka which is an Arabic word meaning a leech. Galen's genesis includes nutfa and khalqa, and then he puts growth and nutrition, which does not comply with Quran, while Quranic staging of nutfa is clear-cut drop stage, which is semen and zygote, which then is khalqa, means different embryonic development leading to formation of fetus, which then grows or nasha. Modern embryology uses the word zygote, embryo and fetus to the very three stages that the Quran describes. Zygote is equal to nutfa, embryo is equal to khalqa, and fetus is equal to nasha. Galen's description of the word semen cannot be compared to fertilized ovum because he does not describe any female gamete. He says the first of that in which as is observed in abortions and dissection, the form of the semen prevails. As cited earlier, what he mentioned was the dominating property of semen while it attracts menstrual blood and feeds on it and grows. This description of Galen does not say anything about female germinal fluid. And as has been shown in the citation above, he believed menstrual blood to behave as a statutory wax to be acted upon by semen. So this form of semen prevails cannot be inferred as zygote or embryo of modern embryology. He then describes the flesh filled with blood in which heart, liver and brain develop and he stated that every organ has its own faculty leading to its formation based upon principles of attraction which means it attracts what is needed and on principle of elimination which means it eliminates what it doesn't need 
an alterative faculty which means that changes the base material to the final material such as blood changing into organs these principles are not befitting to modern scientific advancements and quran does not describe any such thing so what we can conclude that all ancients had a philosophy of embryological development which does not comply with modern science nor with the quran wordings in the quran are jawami al kalim the shortest expression with the widest meaning and so it apparently seems to comply at times with ancient texts but escapes including any unscientific notions present in those texts and if we examine the plentiful description of embryo development in the quran we can feel assured that it is in accord with the modern scientific developments i am not quoting any hadith in this treatise because prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself advised muslims not to attribute technological knowledge to him all hadith related to embryo development were about destiny of humans and were not narrated to tell about embryological developments Can there be scientific statements in scriptures earlier than the Quran? Very few people consider that scriptures complement each other. I took the decision to learn Arabic in Paris. I was 50 exactly at that time. Dr. Maurice Bukai's purpose in studying Arabic and analyzing scientific verses from the Quran was to initiate a friendly dialogue between Christians and Muslims. Being a Christian of faith, He believed that God can reveal books to other people and in a different language than the Bible. The Quran confirms the Gospels and the Torah as revelations, and Islamic revelation states that every nation was sent a messenger for their guidance. He has sent down upon you, O Muhammad, the book in truth, confirming what was before it, and he revealed the Torah and the Gospel before as guidance for the people. and he revealed the Quran but the Quran being the well preserved word of god can be reinterpreted while the previous scriptures cannot many statements in the bible and previous scriptures might have been scientific also as the quran states there are two types of verses quran 37 there must have been two types of verses in the gospels and previous scriptures too the difference between the quran and previous scriptures is that previous scriptures are not well preserved neither in their content nor in their original language of revelation and the jews were cut off from the true religion of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they were cut off from the scripture for quite a while and they were under the influence and the dictatorship and the oppression and the tyranny of the babylonians and that is where a lot of the distortion that happened to the religion of Judaism that is where it occurred it occurred in Babylon where was the Talmud written and who wrote it it was written by the 70 rabbis who were in Babylon and now that is the central and the focus that is the law and the central focus of the yahud now they have left the torah and they are following the talmud and the talmud was written by the rabbis who were influenced by the regime and the environment in Babylon so reinterpretation of the original text of previous revelations is impossible and whatever is written has to be taken as such in the quran generally their details are not there and often it is presented in some other context um, in the quran you do have six days of creation but but the length of days is ambiguous so length of days and again this is uh, from 325 and also 74 so one is in a day the measure of which is a thousand years of what you count and in another place in 74 it says a day the measure of which is 50000 years the details of creation in those 6 days makes biblical statements unscientific while the word yawm mentioned in the quran can be reinterpreted as a long duration of time when god revealed the gospels the wordings used by him might have been corresponding to a long duration of time but the translation has lost that interpretation but in blessing i will bless thee and in multiplying i will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the sea shore the more than 100 billion galaxies contain more stars than there are grains of salt on earth the biblical analogy comparing the number of stars with sand particles can be considered scientific 
as only a few thousand stars are visible to the naked eyes, and it would take a real stretch to compare the number of visible stars with the number of grains of sand in those days. So let's try to understand why it bothers atheists when Muslims boast that the Qur'an contains scientifically correct statements. The first reason could be that calling themselves progressive or scientific or rational is one of the cornerstones of atheism. The confidence of atheists in atheism depends on the assumption that atheism is scientific and acceptance of God's existence is unscientific. That's why when the Big Bang was proposed, and yet needed evidence, atheists were the first to oppose it because of their fear that once the universe is scientifically proven to have a beginning, the question of an originator will arise. Another reason is the prejudice thinking that a book which is 14 centuries old cannot have scientifically relevant statements. So they think Muslims are making it up and thus try to label them as liars. It is difficult for them to swallow that if there is an originator of this universe, then he must have an existence beyond time and space. What appears to us as latest discovery, in science, was known to him forever. It is he, who has arranged creation, on a specific time scale. So the creator of this universe, knew the direction in which human mind will think, and, the progress in science, that humanity will take. I think that ridicule, as various people have said today, uh, ridicule is a fine weapon. I'm not sure where it fits on the Malcolm X, Martin Luther King <laughs> scale. Um, I certainly don't want to advocate violence in any way, um, but uh, ridicule seems to me a more subtle weapon. And ridicule uh, although it won't influence people, the people who are necessarily being ridiculed or their views are being ridiculed, it may very well influence people who are sitting on the fence or who don't, didn't really realize that there was a fence to sit on and tell them that, that there is a fence to sit on. Another is a policy of ridicule. Atheists are commonly arrogant and freely calling names such as ignorant, stupid, brainwashed, etc. The policy of ridiculing theists is well planned and was decided in the World Atheist Convention in 2011. You are of course hurting people's feelings, but they deserve to have their feelings hurt. A Muslim who boasts about his scripture being scientific cannot be ridiculed. I'm talking about specific stages of embryology. For example, the bones are formed first, that's what Keith, Dr. Keith Moore was talking about. On the contrary, Muslims try to show these scientific verses to atheists as a proof of the existence of God trying to shake their faith in atheism. So a well-planned strategy had to be undertaken by atheists to deny the science of the Qur'an. This is in contrary to someone searching for the truth, frequently boasted by the atheists, but rather, suppressing the truth. And to deny the scientific correctness of the Qur'an was a way to ridicule Muslims. That's why Professor P. Z. Myers did not accept the fact that bones develop before the flesh and are later covered by flesh. His aim was to deny the scientific statements in the Quran, and to thus ridicule Muslims who proposed scientific passages of Quran as a sign from God. Yes, bones develop first, then must. Yes, bones develop first, then must. Yes, bones develop first, then must. He accepted that bones develop before muscles, thrice, giving different arguments for this fact being correctly described in the Quran. But when cornered, he said, if Quran says so, then the Quran is wrong. Bones and muscles come simultaneously. There are no embryological details of any consequence in the Quran. This denial was a part of the well-planned attempt to remove people from religion by any possible strategy. The fourth reason is that they look at the statistics of scientific works done by Muslim scientists in recent years, which is not in proportion to the population of Muslims currently in the world. Most of these atheists haven't studied the past scientific contributions of Muslim nations. Let me quote a few writers who describe the contribution of Muslims to science. George Sarton gave a tribute to Muslim scientists in the introduction to the history of science. 
It will suffice here to evoke a few glorious names without contemporary equivalents in the West. Abir ibn Hayyan, Al-Kindi, Al-Khwarizmi, Al-Fargani, Al-Razi, Thabit ibn Qura, Al-Batani, Hanayn ibn Ishaq, Al-Farabi, Ibrahim ibn Sinan, Al-Masudi, Al-Tabari, Abul Wafa, Ali ibn Abbas, Abul Qasim, Ibn al-Yatsar, al-Biruni, Ibn Sina, Ibn Yunus, al-Kashi, Ibn al-Haytham, Ali ibn Isa al-Ghazali, al-Zarqab, Omar Khayyam. A magnificent array of names, which would not be difficult to extend. He wrote further, if anyone tells you that the Middle Ages were scientifically sterile, just quote these men to him, all of whom flourished within a short period, 750 to 1100 AD. Robert Rafalt and the Making of Humanity stated, It was under the influence of the Arabs and Moorish revival of culture and not in the 15th century, that a real renaissance took place. Spain, not Italy, was the cradle of the rebirth of Europe. After steadily sinking lower and lower into barbarism, it had reached the darkest depths of ignorance and degradation when cities of the Sarachanic world, Baghdad, Cairo, Cordova, and Toledo, were growing centers of civilization and intellectual activity. It was there, that the new life arose, which was to grow into new phase of human evolution. From the time when the influence of their culture made itself felt, began the stirring of new life. Forcep deliveries. Probably one of the earliest descriptions of forceps was by a Muslim Arabian obstetrician by the name of al -Bakassas. When you look at these forceps, it's clear this was not a live baby that was delivered. It had crushing teeth, and the idea was to morselate the fetus to remove it so the mother would survive. This was a time in Europe which we often call the Dark Ages when scientific progress came virtually to a standstill. And yet in the Muslim world, there was a lot of uh, advances made. 6. Atheist Efforts to Disprove Scientific Statements in the Qur'an The atheism stands on ridiculing scriptures as centuries-old books that cannot stand the test of time. Atheism tries to convince people of it being scientific, and religion as unscientific and the scientific verses of the Qur'an stand as obstruction in its way. So there are positive attempts to decrease the significance of scientific statements in the Qur'an. The attempts that were taken by atheists in this direction were, 1. To demean the scientists who gave statements in favor of the Qur'an. But then I hit pay dirt. I came across his CV. And in the CV, we see that he lists his education, what he has done, where he has done it, how long he has been wherever. And I find here the association of cytology, but here he was just a consultant. So it does not make him a, a, a fellow of this council. So I don't know where this comes from. Two to meet as many as possible among those scientists and ask them to change their statements. 3. To publish in media that those scientists were misrepresented. Look at what the Koran says about it. It is vague, it is ambiguous. Sure. It's just it's the kind of stuff that a desert nomad might guess. 4. To make a propaganda that what appears in the Quran could have been easily inferred by anyone with a little knowledge. My, point, point. my yeah. point is that there's very little about embryology in the Quran. Yeah, yeah. What there, what there is, details are not there. You're right. Yeah, the right. details are not and there. And yes. what what details are there yeah. are obviously cribbed from Aristotle. No. Five, to attribute plagiarism as the reason of those scientifically correct statements in the Quran. An analysis of atheists' efforts to disprove the scientific correctness of the Qur'an. During Islamic conferences, many non-Arab scientists attended and lectured about science in the Qur'an. Naturally, not all of them were as enthusiastic as Dr. Maurice Bukai in learning Arabic and deducting their own inferences. 
they had to rely on translations of the Qur'an presented to them. Muslims do not lie about the Qur'an. But concerning mutashabihat verses, type 2 above, there are certain words that hold multiple meanings. And so the word can be interpreted in different ways, based upon their personal disposition, as well as their scientific background. The same verse can be translated by different people differently. So based on the scientific knowledge at the time, one interpretation would fit, while another would make no sense. So the translations presented to scientists were selected because they were legitimate translations which coincided with modern research about their subject and their statements were recorded on that basis. Obviously, someone else interviewing them and telling them that they were misled because of their lack of understanding of Arabic would create doubt in their mind. When atheists met them afterwards and tried to convince them that they were being fooled or taken out of context, they had two options. One, accept that what the atheists are saying is true, or two, to learn Arabic and evaluate who was on the wrong side. The political situation of the world is changing fast. After the World Trade Center bombing, there was a wide barrier between Muslims and Westerners. So even if these scientists were not very religious or committed atheists, defending the Qur'an on their own authority required a lot of conviction and an unprejudiced After act. September 11th, which was blamed on Muslims, a wave of hatred against Islam spread in the West, and many efforts to discredit Islam and Muslims were made. In January 2002, soon after 9-11, an article was published by the Wall Street Journal with the title, Western scholars play a key role in touting science of the Qur'an. It referenced one scientist, Joe Lee Simpson, a church-going Presbyterian, who was regretting making statements confirming science in the Qur'an. In that same article, Professor Goringer was said to have asked to confirm that the Qur'anic embryology was not taken from Aristotle. The main presenter of the This is the Truth video, Mr. Zindani, was accused to be a friend of Osama bin Laden, on whom the 9-11 conspiracy was blamed. Naturally, some scientists didn't want to be related to him anymore, as the article in the Wall Street Journal stated. Current Muslims also like to boast a lot, even though both the Qur'an and the Sunnah have discouraged boasting. Boasting incites hatred and encourages stubbornness. So in such an unhealthy environment, one cannot expect an American or a European to learn Arabic and defend the Qur'an. Oh, oh, oh.